Presented by Caltech. It's really a great honor to have as our keynote speaker today and for me to introduce Mark Kane, who's the Anger Vettelsen Professor of Earth and Climate Sciences at Columbia University. Mark got his uh, bachelor's from Harvard and then his PhD from MIT in 1976. Uh, Mark has worked on many uh, fundamental problems uh, in climate sciences. Uh, he has often um, focused on past climates as a way to learn something about future climates and on the many fundamental contributions that he's done to the field. One that was really a breakthrough uh, in the field was the fact that he, together with St uh, Stephen Zibiak, uh, he developed the first numerical model uh, which successfully simulated uh, El Nino, and uh, in 1985, this model made the first forecasts uh, of El Nino that were physically uh, based. Uh, and in fact, the Zibia Kane model has really be become, uh, through the years, uh, one of the standard models that have been used, ex been used extensively uh, to really understand mechanisms linked to El Nino Southern uh, oscillation. Um, Kane, Mark K keeps uh, working on uh, El Nino forecasts uh, and more recently is focused on the role of El Nino and impacts on uh, climate uh, and also on uh, human activities such as agriculture, economy, health and uh, conflict. Um, his uh, contributions to the field have been recognized by many, many awards. Um, I cannot really list them all here because I think you're here to listen to him rather than to me. But to acknowledge a few ones, he received the Sverdrup Gold Medal of the American Meteorological Society and the Maurice Ewing Medal of the American Geophysical Union. He's a fellow, among others, of the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union. And he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Scientists and Sciences and of the National Academy of Sciences. And probably Mark does not remember, but the last time I visited La Monde was two years ago, more or less, to the date, and <laughs> it had just been recently announced that he had been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and I happened to be there the day that La Monde hosted a party uh, to celebrate that event. So I really feel very lucky uh, to have been there at such an important uh, time in your career. So again, thank you so much for being here today, and I'll give to you the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be here and an honor to give this talk. Um, and I just, one disclaimer that uh, my critics would make if they were here, uh, whatever my qualifications are, I, ha I have no at least academic credential as a social scientist. Um, and so uh, in this talk, I'm going on to some stepping on other people's turf. Um, but um, anyway, so the topic is climate and conflict. We'll come back to baseball later. Um, one of my colleagues, Terry Plank, says I always use baseball metaphors at every occasion. I do want to say that uh, I also wanted to thank President Obama who uh, earlier today gave a speech in which he pointed out that uh, climate change constitutes a serious threat to global security, an immediate risk to our national security, and make no mistake, it will impact how our military defends our country. So um, he seems to be, it was, it was very kind of him to pick today to give this talk <laughs> and, uh, and set me up nicely. Uh, Here's the outline. I'm going to talk a little bit in a not very deep way, but just about some frameworks for thinking about how climate might impact conflicts. I'm then going to talk about two pieces of work that I was associated with. One is a quantitative study uh, and the real uh, genius behind that is uh, Saul Shang, who's now at Berkeley, but was a student at Columbia when we did this work. Um, and uh, the connection between the El Nino Southern Oscillation and climate, and that's a quantitative study. Uh, the other is a study of Syria, uh, particularly Syria and the Mediterranean, and that 
is more of a case study of a recent drought and the conflict going on in Syria there. And I will here acknowledge, in addition to Saul Shung and Kyle Mung, who is now at UC Santa Barbara, um, the, my co-authors on that case study, Colin Kelly, who's also now at, also at Santa Barbara, Shara Motadi, who was, uh, when we started this, was a, uh, a sophomore at Columbia and um, really brought the political issue to us. Uh, and she's fantastic. Me, Richard Seeger, who's in, sitting in the front row where he can heckle, as usual. And uh, Yochanan Kushner. OK. Uh, w one of the aspects of talking about climate and, and conflict that um, raises hackles is the fear among social scientists that you're shading into some kind of climate determinism. So I wish to start by saying, as a cause of conflict, I don't, I'm not saying that climate is as important as poverty, poor governance, ethnic and religious divisions, or culture, which I won't even, of course, try to define here. Uh, all of these factors come in, and we'll see a lot of them in the, when we get to the Syria story. Now, uh, one way of thinking about societal impacts of climate that is interesting is this diagram um, that is uh, based on an essay by William McNeil, who is uh, my favorite historian. And it's essentially saying that if you dynamics of social evolution, social and economic factors, um, people act on those. They have expectations. There are, of course, unintended consequences. And so the actual outcome is an entanglement of um, war, disease, climate, migrations, whatever. Uh, the other connection in this diagram is ecosystems, which are connected to social um, systems, and um, phys variations in the physical climate, which impact agriculture, disease, and societies directly. And from a kind of um, uh, pedagogical or, or even uh, you know, um, research point of view, it's worth pointing out that this is the only box in the diagram that only has arrows going out of it. So if you study something where there's a climate impact, at least you can say, this, until recently, that the social systems had no uh, effect, back effect on climate. Uh, that, of course, is uh, perhaps no longer true. Um, another source, if you will, for the way I think about things is this book, Constant Battles While We Fight, by, a, by a, an anthropologist, Stephen LeBlanc. And the simplified version of his story, the main message of this book is uh, to say there was never some ideal time of Rousseauian, um, you know, lovely primitive peoples that people basically always tended to kill each other uh, in uh, substantial numbers. And even the primitive small groups that you think didn't kill a lot of people, percentage-wise did because they fought all the time. But the other point is he had a kind of model for how these conflicts come about. So imagine times are good, climate in particular is favorable, and carrying capacity is large, so populations expand. Then climate takes a turn for the worse. And so the land that each group is on can no longer carry the expanded population. And the choices basically then come down to starving or fighting. And being human, we fight. Okay. So that, that is one of the, if you want a kind of paradigm for how climate might affect um, lead to conflicts. It's very, in this picture, it would be the variations, good times going into bad times, that would be uh, particularly damaging. Okay? While I'm plugging books, um, <laughs> I'll plug my own as a transition toward talking about El Nino a bit. And as I always say, 
uh, please go buy the book so that my royalties may creep into the low three figures. <laughs> you don't have to read it. <laughs> Okay, uh, probably most of you, especially in California, are familiar with El Nino, and so I can do this uh, quickly and broadly, uh, which I would do anyway in the context of this talk. El Nino has come to be uh, an, uh, now defined as an oceanographic phenomenon in which uh, the tropical Pacific warms. This is a map of temperature anomalies um, in the tropical Pacific in December 82, the 82-83 event was one of the bigger events, uh, certainly in the last hundred years. And um, you can see that you've warmed a quarter of the globe uh, considerably along the tropics. These here anomalies get up to four degrees C. That's a huge uh, perturbation to the thermal boundary condition that the atmosphere feels. That changes what happens in the atmosphere. Now, the Southern Oscillation is, ah, before that, okay. We often use as an index of uh, El Nino, the average temperature anomaly in this box, which is called Nino 3, okay. And you can see it cuts through the heart of the anomaly um, that uh, characterizes El Nino. And um, it's, it's, there are a bunch of different indices. They're all reasonably equivalent. One of the other things that goes along with El Nino is what's called the Southern Oscillation, a kind of seesawing of mass between the Eastern Pacific and the Western Pacific. It is usually, it's most often measured by an index, which is a normalized pressure difference between um, Tahiti and Darwin. And I'm going to use uh, what is just as good, the, just the sea level pressure at Darwin. Notice two things. This sea level pressure is an atmospheric variable. At a, this is a point halfway around the world from that region where we're measuring the oceanographic variable. If I put the two, together, and this is a time, time record from 1860-something to um, 2000 and something. Uh, and you can see that these two things go together. You don't really, uh, I forget what the correlation coefficient is, but it doesn't matter. And those of you who do almost any kind of geophysics know that you virtually never get two things to be this close unless you're basically looking at aspects of the same phenomenon. And these, uh, the, the essence of the El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomena, or ENSO, is a coupling between the tropical ocean and atmosphere. So the fact that they track together is not an accident. What is curious is that uh, Nino 3 is in degrees Celsius and the Darwin uh, sea level pressure is in um, um, millibars, and uh, for some reason they are have the same amplitude. <laughs> okay. What makes El Nino interesting, of course, uh, for the world is the the as the global impacts it has, particularly in places where people live, and. Uh, California aside, the main places where this is true are in, tend to be in the tropics. So typically in an El Nino year, um, you have below average rainfall in northern Australia and through Indonesia, downright drought. It tends to be warm and dry in southern Africa, wet in East Africa, uh, warmer along the, in North America. Um, Usually one predictor of El Nino, if the Canadians are going to host the Winter Olympics, it's going to be an El Nino year, <laughs> so they run out of snow. <laughs> okay, of course it may soon be that everybody will run out of snow and that'll be a different issue. Uh, and these are the two seasons, the opposite phase of El Nino, La Nina when it's very cold in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, 
is almost but not quite the opposite set of anomalies. Now, what Saul in particular did was to identify regions that are I impacted by El Nino, called teleconnected countries here. Uh, and the ones that are teleconnected are shown in red, and the weakly affected countries are shown in blue. Now, when they say weakly affected, okay, it's, um, it's this. Uh, there's a, the country has to have most of its population pixels affected by El Nino. For the, the U.S. isn't in there because effects are opposite, so they cancel out, okay? Uh, because certainly, as you know, El Nino has a large impact on the U.S. So these are the countries in play. And what we did was um, in, well, let me put the picture up, okay? There's a database at the Oslo Peace Center of conflict. And in this case, uh, civil conflict is defined as something where the government is involved on one side and at least 25 people died, and we're only plotting onsets. That is, something, a conflict that persists into the second year only gets counted once, okay? And what uh, comes out of that is this diagram. If I take a measure, and actually this is the, that Nino 3 index that I showed you, from negative to positive, and we, and we plot the number of conflicts or the percentage per year of conflict risk, okay, you get this curve, which in a linear approximation is this curve. There is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, two sigma kind of confidence limit. And uh, it's basically clear, I think, there are the chances of uh, conflict in an El Nino year are much greater than the chances of conflict in a La Nina year or in a neutral year for that matter, okay? And you can, rather than the straight line, you can see in this kind of neutral territory, there's not too much to say, but when you get to the more extremes on either side, you begin to get uh, changes in uh, conflict. The data avail is available roughly from 1950, okay, and um, so that's what this is. The finding the Nino uh, data is not such a problem. The con as you might imagine, data on conflict risk has uh, a number of issues. You can also do this taking conflicts that involve a thousand people. There are fewer of them, so it gets harder to establish statistical significance, but it points in the same direction. You get the same qualitative result. Okay. Why is the teleconnected tele line monotonic? For the La Nina, there's a climate effect too. So wouldn't that cause the increase in conflict if it's a change in climate? That's a good question. Why, uh, why aren't all departures from normal equal yeah. in terms of conflict? Um, we'll come, when I talk about, remind me if I don't, when I talk about mechanisms or ideas, I'll give you some hints why that might be true. But actually, I can say one thing right now. There's an asymmetry in particular on um, rainfall over land in the tropics. So El Nino is less rainfall. La Nina is more rainfall. More rainfall is not as bad as less rainfall for most people. There's also an asymmetry in human tolerance for temperature change, okay? Most people don't like it when it's too hot. We'll come back to that, okay? Verification of a sort, okay, and this will come in again, is in the countries that aren't affected, if you make, try to make the same connection, you don't find it, which is good because you're not supposed to find it. Indeed they do, and yes. you can, yeah. you can uh, one can speculate in various ways. I mean, one thing is that uh, 
It's not a secret that tropical countries are generally poorer and more conflict prone. Okay. It might be that places with, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time to go into this, but here, but it may well be that places with more conflict, more uh, climate variability, okay, uh, also are places which are uh, less resilient in general. Okay, and the places more affected. In the tropics, um, there's the kind of, cli of climate variability you get is more, uh, in a sense, serious than um, mid latitudes. But that's really off the point. Um, okay. If you're like me, uh, you want something to calibrate the notion of a conflict. What, what, what is the comparable for a change in conflict risk of, say, from 3% to 6%? Okay. And so what's shown over here is conflict risk versus income. Okay. And essentially, the result is that uh, this change from El Nino to La Nina or uh, gives you the same change in conflict risk that look comparing countries where the income is $1,000 per capita to the income with $10,000 per capita, an order of magnitude change in income, in other words. So it's not a trivial effect. Okay. So this is a summary, and I won't go into take the time about how we do this, but essentially there's a greater risk of conflict in the teleconnected group, as somebody questioned. Uh, the change from one end to the other of this El Nino spectrum is a change from 3% to 6%, which is roughly like uh, increasing income, per capita income by an order of magnitude. And it affects, uh, and so affects a lot of, a lot of conflicts. Uh, one of the things about doing this kind of statistical study is then why? What is the connection between uh, El Nino events or so on and um, the uh, conflict? And the other thing which is inescapable these days is what are the implications for anthropogenic climate change? So what are the mechanisms? Well, the first thing we thought of was food prices. Okay? And it's hard to say. It turns out to be more difficult to understand how food prices vary in places where there are conflict. You have to know something about how they're connected to or not connected to local and global uh, trade networks, food networks. So I used to think that was important. I don't anymore, but we're trying to work on that and it turns out to be, uh, as I say, hard to tease out the data for it. Okay. Loss of livelihood. I think this is more important um, to begin with. Okay. If you're a farm worker and you're out of work, then your ability to buy food uh, has changed far more than it was changed by some increase in food price. If you have no income, you can't do it. The other thing that is important, as we'll come back to, is this kind of loss of, of identity. If you're a farmer in a rural village, you can't make a living there anymore. Um, your sense of worth is challenged, but also maybe you have to move away, or maybe your neighbors have moved away. And so whatever social cohesion existed before is um, if not destroyed, at least diminished. Okay. Now, the, there are many studies that show that conflicts increase with temperature. And El Nino does make the tropics generally warmer. Okay. So the first of these studies, I'll, I, I won't go through them all. There's a, a kind of meta-study by Saul Shung and others that was published in Science last year, I think, uh, showing, collecting all the studies of this kind and uh, basically showing 
this result, but I'm going to give you some particular studies. Okay. One is uh, my personal favorite is the hit by pitch study. Okay. And that's, um, <laughs> that's this. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> I'm the pitcher on one of these teams. It's a fantasy moment. And <laughs> okay. I'm the pitcher and your pitcher hits one of my guys. Okay. Now it turns out, and that's what these curves show that <clears throat> the chances that I will retaliate by hitting one of your guys, okay, increases with temperature. <laughs> okay. Now, whether, ex you know, you can ask why that is. See, baseball is great because it has this tremendous store of statistical information <laughs> that you can use, okay. You can have, you know, almost 100 years of who got hit by pitches. And then it's just a matter of getting the temperature data for the locations at the time. And, you know, for most of this time, there weren't indoor stadiums or anything like that. So, okay. So all of these curves go up. And in fact, uh, you know, the, uh, with go up with temperature. Um, there you go. I mean, that, <laughs> I mean, that would matter. I mean, yeah. Does it? I mean, in baseball, the late season games matter more. They they matter more, but uh, um, actually, there've been a lot of guys hit early in this season. The other problem is, if it's cold, they don't have good control. But the retaliation is something else. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. There's an arc to the season, which is also an arc to the weather. So it's, uh, you know, it goes along. Um, it's a good thing hockey is played on ice. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Nonviolence. Okay. Next. Next. There's this lovely study of Dutch policemen. Now, you know, an image of Dutch policemen is nice. They're nice people. And they do these training things where they, uh, they show them a video of someone who might have something, you know, a weapon, a possible weapon. Maybe it's a weapon, maybe it isn't a weapon, okay? And maybe they're going to hit you with this weapon, and then maybe it would be a good idea to draw your gun and then even maybe to shoot, okay? And so they give them this as a training exercise, and these people, rig at all. Uh, what they did was they, they did this twice. One said, I think, uh, 20 degrees C and then at 27 degrees C, which doesn't actually seem that warm to me. Okay. But the results were very clear. The chances <laughs> that the policeman would interpret this video as threatening went up with temperature. Okay. The chances that they would think they had to, you know, draw a weapon went up with temperature. The chances that they would shoot went up with temperature. Okay. So that's a Dutch policemen. I mean. Okay. And then uh, one more. Uh, okay. So I Pray thee, good Mercutio, let's retire. The day is hot, the Capulets abroad. And if we meet, we shall not scape a brawl. For now these hot days is the mad blood stirring. Okay. So Shakespeare, who knew people, understood that, you know, hot was not good. And um, <laughs> I commend, and you know, indeed after that, it, it all went downhill. <laughs> okay. I commend this particular Baz Luhrmann uh, version. Uh, she went on to join the CIA, and um, he went on to other things like playing J. Edgar Hoover among them. Okay. And if you think the Capulets are not scary, uh, you know, think again. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, does that mean that? Um, Global warming will lead to more civil conflicts. 
Well, okay. A lot of the objection to studies like, let's say, the El Nino study is, well, you can't take these local, you know, that's global, that was better, but a lot of the other studies are of local weather. Well, that doesn't uh, scale up globally, so we ignore that. If you try to look at a long-term variation, okay, there are confounding social political changes. So you can't say that any change in the past is due solely to um, climate. You know, maybe the king got up on the wrong side of the bed and decided to fight. And there's a, a piece in Nature which summarizes the contention, and there are a couple of up sort of nature or science, I can't remember, op-eds by Andy Solo saying, why don't you guys all calm down? Um, but that didn't have much effect. Now, ENSO is global, and as I was saying in the first slide from uh, after McNeil, okay, it's, it's clearly independent of any socio-political influence. It does what it wants, and so the connection to climate is, um, you know, is, is, is quite real. Then the objection might be, well, but that's a shorter term change and it doesn't necessarily carry over to a long term change. Okay? And I think that's just not the right way to think about it because that's not uh, actually germane. What's germane to me is uh, based on, you could base on this picture which was in IPCC uh, AR, the not the last one, but the one before, okay? And it's this, uh, do the simplest thing. Suppose that the distribution of something, in this case temperature, stays the same, but except that the mean shifts, okay? The consequence of that is that there's a whole lot more hot weather and a whole lot more record hot weather. I mean, in this case, you know, disappeared, but so even if the only change is in the mean, okay, which is surely happening already, okay, uh, then the extreme events, the frequency of extreme events is going to go up, okay. And so I think, you know, it's not clear, will people adjust to that? Well, uh, maybe up to a point, but you know, we're, I mean, we're um, biological creatures. We have a certain physiology at a certain temperature. It begins to bother us. We don't necessarily get used to it. People might think, oh, like people who live in the Caribbean uh, would be unaffected by this. But in another piece of work, Saul showed that, for example, productivity of Caribbean workers, this is in industrial sectors, not agriculture even, goes down when the temperature goes up. It's less clear what will happen in general to um, water balance in any particular place. Okay, so let me now switch to the second piece of work, which is uh, again based on this paper. Oops, yeah, 2000, which was out in March something like that, so I suppose it's new. And there was an earlier uh, paper that I wasn't part of that just looked at, uh, at climate. Okay, so what has the climate been like in Syria in particular and Eastern Mediterranean in general? And uh, the answer uh, is drought. Uh, might this impact what's happened in Syria? We'll come to that. And then finally, why has there been a drought? Can we uh, say that anthropogenic climate change had anything to do with it? All right. So um, these are obviously, once again, from the New York Times. Um, and this is from October 2010, which is roughly a year or so before these conflicts got going. And the top picture caption is that a uh, 50,000 families migrated from rural areas due to the drought, okay? The other caption is uh, refugees have left their farmlands and are living in tents because of a drought, okay? Th there was, uh, as I'll show here, there, 
This is, um, let's start with the top picture. This is the winter. This is a place where it only rains in winter. So winter is rain. Winter rain is rain. Okay, and we have um, two different uh, two different estimates of what the rainfall is. One from the climate search unit at uh, East Anglia. The other the GPCP GPCC one. Uh, early in the record, they don't agree very well. From about 1930, they start there starts to be enough data, so it's fairly reasonable uh, and. Over this period, there's a trend. There's a downward trend. And one consequence, if you look at the low points, okay, the lowest point of all is in this recent period, 2007 to 2010 or so. And in particular, if you say, okay, I, one year of drought can be withstood by most, um, most, most, societies because after all th bad things do happen. Maybe two, but not three. So if we look at this, we see that not only is this the worst year, but these three are by far the worst three years in this record. And we'll come back a little bit to this point. The other thing to say is that what agriculture, of course, cares about is not just rain, but water balance. And temperature has been increasing in this region, as it has over lots of the, most of the Earth. Okay? And therefore, evaporation would go up. And so the water balance at the surface, P minus E, uh, is going down for both of these reasons. OK. Uh, here's one satellite picture to show the, some sort of estimate of, uh, one sort of estimate of what the drought did. And it's in particular in this northeast uh, part of Syria and extending into Iraq and Turkey that the drought is most severe. And much of the migration that began and came to the cities in Syria uh, came out of that, that region, uh, which is, of course, being fought over today. Now, I don't. Again, I don't mean to say that the only thing going on here that matters is climatic, is a drought. Okay? Um, we have to remember that uh, George W. Bush sent all of these Iraqi, made all these Iraqis refugees, and many of them ended up in, in Syria. Most of them ended up in Syria. So the population in Syria and the cities went up sharply. Also, as I'm just saying, the um, number of internally displaced persons in Syria went up too. And that is more of a consequence of the drought. But you had all of these, you had both of these influences essentially putting tremendous stress on the resources of uh, urban centers in Syria. The other thing. Um, which I won't take the time to go into in de any kind of detail, but for a while under the first Assad, Hafez al-Assad, he wanted to make Syria self-sufficient in food, and so they put a lot of attention into that and did indeed achieve self-sufficiency. One of the consequences of that was pumping a lot of groundwater. They didn't really bother about irrigation methods that were efficient or farming methods that would save water. So uh, you made the whole country more vulnerable, essentially, by um, drawing down alternate su supplies of water in the face of drought. OK. So all of these things come together. And the, this also means that the population, in addition to natural population increase in the cities, you had an enormous population increase because of uh, refugees from both from Iraq and from rural parts of Syria. And uh, what do they say? Okay. When a displaced Syrian farmer was asked if this was about the drought, she replied, of course, the drought and unemployment were important in pushing people toward revolution. Okay. And when the drought happened, we can handle it for two years, and then we said, it's enough. That's why we use, basically, this quote is why we use three years as a cutoff. 
um, we have we we took the word of the local expert. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what do we have? We had a drought of extreme duration and intensity, which led to food scarcity, loss of agricultural livelihoods, the collapse of rural society. And I don't I won't go through all of that, but in the paper we have the documentation. Essentially, you have places where 80 or more percent of the people left, the schools empty out. Um, essentially, they, they're, uh, you know, what had been a pretty stable society was destroyed. They migrated to these urban slums. You had a government that could care less would, and certainly didn't do anything um, due to indifference and, in, and incompetence. Take your pick, okay? And this led to discontent, anger, conflict, and which finally became the civil war that's going on now. And you may remember uh, that if you, know, you f if you were thinking of the incident that touched this off, it was some kids writing slogans on walls in Dara. And that essentially is um, you know, one of these peripheral urban slums that um, was a locus of discontent because nothing really was done uh, there. So this is a story um, that has, you know, all of these elements are important, okay? It would be nice to be able to quantify how important they all are, but the kind of, um, let's say, model of social systems you would need to do that is uh, not something we have now. Okay, so let's go back and now talk about why is there drought in this region and does anthropogenic climate change have anything to do with it? Okay, well, um, okay, we have uh, this phenomenon in the Atlantic called the North Atlantic Oscillation um, that uh, uh, essentially, you can think of as having two phases. In one phase, the airflow across the Atlantic is sort of from south, more from southwest to northeast, so it brings warmer, wetter conditions to northern Europe and leaves the Mediterranean region dry. In the other phase, phase this jet comes, storm track comes more straight across in which case the Mediterranean uh, is wet and it's colder and somewhat drier in Northern Europe. And this is a well-studied phenomenon in terms of, um, well, in many ways in terms of how it happens and what the impacts are and so on. If we look now in the Mediterranean and we just take an index of the NAO, which, you know, for example, a typical index is pressure difference between um, rates of Iceland and uh, the Azores. Um, and you correlate with Mediterranean rainfall, you get a picture like this. So with, um, uh, po yeah, so with positive NAO, it's basically, uh, I guess, how do you do this? It's like this. If I then if I were instead to just look over the, the 20th century and then some for the principal pattern of Mediterranean rainfall, that would be the picture on the bottom. The color schemes are different, which is unfortunate, but you can see the tendency um, as this is done for, well, basically what I want to say is that these patterns are pretty much the same to within, um, pretty much the same, okay? The major features are pretty much the same. Now, this is all well and good, and one of the things I'm gonna point out now is that Syria, the Levant, is at a node in this pattern, okay? So this is a place where the NAO influence is not compelling. For most of the Mediterranean, you look at for what the NAO does, you get out a lot of the rainfall signal, okay? 
But since it's opposite on opposite sides, it's got to go through zero somewhere. And where it goes through zero is essentially in Syria. So if I look there, OK, um, I see that there's a residual. And the residual is a trend, and which we, for uh, reasons that um, include theory and model results, we can associate with the increase of, in, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, there are these places where this pattern, which is the residual after we take out the NAO, is important, this trend. Okay. And in the Middle East here, okay, it is a place where this anthropogenic influence is comparable or greater than that due to the natural, presumed natural variability of the NAO. Okay? So we'll be able to identify, in general, anthropogenic signals only where the natural variability is small. If, this, if anthropogenic is the signal and natural variability of the noise, it's just a, you know, saying, if signal to noise is large enough, then you'll be able to pull out the signal. And one way to do that is to, is to go to a place where the noise is small. Um, and Syria is such a place. OK, so we're back then to the idea that um, climate change is an extreme, uh, is an increase in extreme events because you have always the ups and downs of droughts. It's not like the recent decade is the first time they had a drought, but that drought was more severe. Okay. That drought was more somewhere in here, and this is not a drought picture, but uh, it was over there. And the question is, is there, what are the chances that um, that became more likely because of anthropogenic climate change. Now again, okay, um, this is the three-year running mean of Syrian rainfall, and you have this trend. This only goes back to 1930 because essentially that's the data that we trust. And uh, the red is the total, and the blue dashed curve shows you what happens if you take out the downward trend which is, we could presume, is due to the uh, greenhouse gas forcing. And we presume that in part because, frankly, we can't think of anything else that would do it. Okay. The second, another reason, um, we'll come to that in a second. All right. So the observed, if I, instead of doing this, I make probability distributions more like this picture, okay? Then, um, again, now you want to be looking on this side. So the red is the total. The blue is what it would have been if you hadn't had the trend. And the point is in this region, which are the extreme droughts, you've increased the probability of extreme droughts quite a bit, okay? So essentially, uh, just taking this totally at face value, where there's a 5% chance um, of a drought this severe, this severe now, okay, there was no chance of it before, and where droughts that are in the upper 10% altogether for this record were only about 4% if you didn't have the downward trend. Okay. Further support for this idea is from models, and models actually do, models can't be trusted everywhere, but they do a fairly good job on the Mediterranean and on this, on this part of the world, okay? And in this case, we have runs that are called HISNAT, which means the model was forced only by natural variability, solar fluctuations, volcanoes, and so on over the uh, 1931 to 2004 period, okay? And the 
Um, we contrast that with a run called Hist, which is in red, which has everything. And again, you get this pattern out of this where the extreme events down here have become far more likely. And so based on this, and the other thing I should say, and I won't go into this too much, but the theory we have about how global warming works also uh, supports the models and the observations that this is a place where you would expect enhanced, um, so ex basically less rainfall, enhanced subsidence and less rainfall. Okay, so uh, we estimate based on that that something like two to the chances of a drought as extreme as the one that occurred uh, increased by two or three times because of uh, anthropogenic impacts on the climate system. So conclusions all together. Uh, climate change affects societies in complex ways, direct and indirect, droughts and floods, food scarcity and famine, disease, environmental degradation, especially when there are big climate, a lot of climate variability, conflicts, um, diminished societal resilience, and you know, uh, just making people cranky by getting too hot. Okay. Climate variability is a stress because societies are always geared toward normal. And so it's the extremes that tend to be most damaging. And anthropogenic climate change will increase the extremes in these cycles. And I mean, that's the particular aspect that I'm pointing to as uh, a threat rather than looking at a, the smaller secular change. So thank you.